verses 23 and 24. And it reads, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Father God, for giving us a chance just to bow our heads to you, just to lift your name, and just to come before you. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, forgive us for messing up, forgive us for falling short, forgive us for not doing the things that are pleasing in your sight. Now, Lord, we ask you to speak to us tonight through your word. Bless your word, Father God, that it will fall on good soil. Bless your word, Father God, that men, women, boys, and girls throughout this entire world be saved, will be converted, and we'll be committed to you. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many services. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Yes. Jesus 
has lived in me. Jesus has, has lifted us one more again, hadn't he? He's given us another chance to get it right with him. Tonight we'll be looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. 1 Chronicles, in the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. We're going to take one more look, one more good look at prayer. One more look at prayer, what prayer does, how God reacts, and how we ought to react when we talk to God. Amen? So we're taking one more look at prayer. How many of you want your prayers answered? Mm. You do? Why do you want your prayers answered? So you can receive what you're paying for what you're praying, so you can have a better life. Anybody else want your prayers answered? Yeah. Anybody want their prayers answered? Yeah. Okay. So we all want our prayers answered. When you pray, what what what's the answer you want? What's the answer you really want when you pray? What's the answer? Are y'all just praying? I want, I want yes. Okay, you want yes. You want. You want your prayer, you want your answer to be yes to your prayer, right? I want him to answer. You, you don't want God to be filling around. You don't want God to say no. You don't even want God to say wait, do you? You want God to say yes, the answer is yes, and I want it right now, right? You want it right now. You want your answer right now. So look at let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. We're, we're looking at this guy that's mentioned in the Bible, and then he goes off the scene to never show up again. His name is Jabez. Jabez. There, there are at least two people that show up. They're on the scene. They're mentioned by name. There are many who are not mentioned at all. They are, they are not, their names are not mentioned. Boy, if they went to New Beginning Church, boy, it would be mayhem, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. If they, they showed up on the scene and their names weren't mentioned, mm -hmm. whoo, people would have a fit. Mm -hmm. But Jabez's name is mentioned, and then he's mentioned no more. Mm -hmm. Methuselah. Who was Methuselah? The oldest man that ever lived. How old was Methuselah? Oh. 969 years old. 969 years old, Methuselah. He's mentioned, and he's off the scene. Methuselah, Methuselah was born, Methuselah lived, Methuselah died, and he's mentioned no more. Is that you? Is that, is that what you're looking for God to do with you? You were born, you live, and you die. Jabez. The difference between Jabez and Methuselah is that Jabez has a positive name. He has a positive name. I didn't say he had a good name. His reputation as we read of him is positive. But he didn't have a good name. Let's look at it. First Chronicles chapter 4 verse number 9. Now, Jabez was more honorable, a positive name. He was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez. And she called his name Jabez, saying, because I bow him in pain. Right then, verse number nine, we find Jabez having a positive name, but it wasn't a good name. His mama called him Jabez because she bore him in pain. Now, when we look at this, what did the woman expect? God said that every woman that has a baby will be in pain. But there was something different about this pain that this woman bore Jabez in. 
It was grievous pain. It was heartache pain. Jabez was born and his mama was in pain. And the thing about Jabez's name is that everywhere he went, they said, there come pain. <laughs> there come grief. There come despair. There come sorrow. So the name Jabez means grief. The name Jabez means pain. The name Jabez means sorrowful. The name Jabez means sorrow. His mama bow him in pain, so she named him pain. His mama boo him, bore him in sorrow, so she named him sorrow. His mama bow him in sorrowful situations, so she bore him, she called him Jabez. Here come old pain. What nickname did they give you that you didn't like? <laughs> Anybody in the room got a nickname that they didn't like? <laughs> and everybody in the neighborhood knew knew that you had a bad name. You, you had you had a nickname. Yep. What did they call you? Mm. And you didn't like it. Anybody? Anna Any? Huh? Annette. Annette. Yep. Why they call you Anna Net? Just like G made us call it, you Pain. Coran. Coran. What did they call you? Okay, all right. So there are many people who have nicknames that they don't want. Nicknames that, that they don't like. But this wasn't Jabez's nickname. It was his name. And his name meant pain. His name meant sorrow. His name meant grief. His name, his name meant sorrowful. So he wasn't born in the best of situations. So Jabez was already behind the eight ball. What does that mean? He was already behind the eight ball. He was already behind the eight ball. He was already. What's the eight ball? He started out life with a target on his back. He, he started out life with a target on his back. He started off out, out life in, in a situation where he wasn't destined to win. He started out in life that was discouraging. Y'all remember Wilma Rudolph? What was it about Wilma Rudolph that could have been discouraging? Wilma Rudolph had problems with her legs. Wilma Rudolph's siblings would have to massage her leg night after night to try to get rid of the pain. The doctors had said she would never walk. But what happened to Wilma Rudolph? Not only did she walk, she ran. Not only did she run, she ran fast. Not only did she run fast, she ran her way into the history books. So it says to us tonight, regardless of the circumstances in which you are born, God can bless you, God can keep you, and God can use you. Regardless of the neighborhood you're born in, God can still give you favor. Regardless of how bad the children mark you or bully you, God can still protect you and keep you. Regardless of the social class you grew up in or you were born in, God still can favor you. Regardless of, of the situation of hopelessness, God can still give you favor above what you can even ask or think. So Jabez, he was more honorable, meaning that he operated in truth 
and he operated in righteous principles. He was more honorable than his brothers. He was more honorable than any of his brothers. He operated in truth. He operated in righteousness. He had godly principles about him. So it says to us tonight, regardless of the circumstances you're born in, God expects you to operate in truth. God expects you to operate in righteousness. Many guys try to justify how they act toward people by saying, I didn't have a dad in the house. God expects you, regardless if you had family, as most did or did not have, God expects you to operate in godliness, in truth, in righteousness. God expects that of you. If you didn't grow up with running water, God expects you to operate in truth. He expects you to be humble, and he expects you to be honorable. The problem with many who, who gain something late in their lives, they are not humble. God expects you to operate in righteousness. God expects you to operate in truth. God expects you to operate in, with an humble spirit and be an honorable person. The mama even explains. <laughs> Your name j Bad boy. Because you were born in bad situations. Your name is Jabez because not only uh, do when I look at, not only when I look at you, I see pain. She says, I bow him in pain. So to, to, to really, really get to where the rubber meets the road, Jabez's name was pain. Here come old pain. Here come old sorrow. Here come this rascal that no one wants to be around. Let me just park right here and say, even if others don't want to be around you, God can still give you faith. Isn't that something? When other people forsake you, the psalmist says God will raise you up. The psalmist even says, when your mother and your father forsake you, then God will raise you up. So what's your excuse? Is it your job? Is that a good enough excuse? Is it your, your lifestyle? Is that your excuse? Is it your neighborhood? Is that your excuse? <laughs> Is it that you don't have certain things? Is that your excuse? Jabez did not lean on the excuses. There's so many people in the modern day church got so many excuses. True. You won't believe it, but, but pastors all over this world have had, they've heard this one. I would have been there, but my dog died. I would have been there, but I lost my cat. And I know there are animal lovers all over the world, but it's a problem when you begin to love your animal more than you love God. Or you love your animal more than you love people. In this great United States of America, guess what? There are people who are more adamant about loving animals than they love people. Because the same people will watch a man or a woman die. Do nothing about it, say nothing about it, but don't you kill a animal. God wants us to love people. God wants us to walk in righteousness among people. Jabez was more honorable, more righteous, more operating in truth than all of his brothers. His mother named him or called his name Jabez because she bore him in pain. Let's look at what, what the, the author turns the, the, the page and says in verse number 10. Verse 10, he says, in Jabad, the same pain, Jabad, the same trouble, Jabad, the same one who was sorrowful, Jabad 
the one who was humble, the one who was honorable, the one who was righteous, the one who operated in truth, and Jabez called on the God of Israel. It says Jabez called. This word called in the original Hebrew means that he cried out. This word called means that he uttered aloud. He uttered loudly. He put something into it. He called out to God. Let me tell you, when you're going through pain, when your name is pain, when people don't see who you really are and people doubt who you are, you need to call out to God. He says, Jabez cried out, uttered out loudly to God. Jabez called on God. There are some things you just can't keep in. There are some things you just don't, you can't go before God and say, well, Lord, here I am again. Your humble servant bowing before you again. There are some times you just got to cry out to him. I, I, see, I see these young people, parents, who these young people who are being killed all over America. And, and the judge says, I don't want any noise in the room. But when the verdict comes down, you just can't keep it. It's a pain deep down within you that you either have to cry out to God or thank God. So, so verse 10, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10 says, And Jabez called on the God of Israel. Now you got to know who to call to. <laughs> You, you have to know to call to God. You have to know to cry out to God. And then the next thing you need to know, you need to know which God to cry out to. Jabez cried out to God, the God who could bless him. We crying out to the wrong people. We crying out to the wrong thing. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10 says, Jabez called on the God of Israel. We have to cry out to the God of Israel. Why Israel? Because this God, this God of Israel is a proven God. He has proved himself over and over and over again. Ask the president of Egypt. Did he prove himself? You know, the word Pharaoh is not a name. Pharaoh is the title. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh is the leader. So as Moses went into Egypt and told Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. Pharaoh denied that right. Guess what happened? Plague started taking place. Mm -hmm. then, then the firstborn, including Pharaoh's child, died. Let me tell you. You need to learn to call on the right God. And the reason why he says call on the God of Israel, this God is a proven God. He is the proven God. He has proved himself over and over and over again. Has he ever proved himself in your life? Yes. And guess what? He may not come when you want him. He's right. But he's always on time. And when he does come, he always does more than we intended for him to do. He bless us with stuff tangible and non-tangible or untangible or intangible. He keeps blessing us with stuff we can't see. He blesses us in the midst of our mess on our way here tonight. You know, we live in a city where it's dangerous just to drive down the street. <laughs> you, better, you better not blow your horn. Right. Somebody sitting at the red light, the light turns mm -hmm. green, don't blow your horn. Sit there and wait. Wait, to, wait it out to the next light. Mm -hmm. If you can't go around, mm -hmm. just sit there. So God, tonight, just tonight alone, God blessed us through danger seen and unseen. He blessed us. 
because he's God. And he is the proven God. He keeps proving himself over and over and over and over and over and over again. And check this out. He doesn't prove himself over and over again because we've been so good. Or because we're so holy. He proves himself over and over again because that's his nature. That's his character. So Jabez called on God. He called on the proven God. He called on the God of Israel. In other words, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The one who promised Isaac, who promised Abraham, who promised Jacob, and who delivered every time. And that same God is promising us. That's the God you got to call on. This is the God that you must call on. He says, verse 10, and Jabez called on the God. Look at what he says. Definite article D. Why he didn't say a God? He said the God. And check out how, what case is in. It's in the upper case. What does that tell us? It's, in the, it's capitalized. What does that tell us? Almighty. He's the almighty God. He's the only true and the living God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's the gods of our four parents. He is the God. You notice it's capitalized. So people, please, don't, when you're talking about this God, always talk about him with a capital G. All right, man. If, you're in, if you're printing his name or printing his title, Make sure you capitalize his name and his title. That's, that's how we separate him in writing from all the other gods. He's the God with the big G. He's, he's the God that, that has brought Israel over. And he's the same God that has brought us over. The next thing we see, just, just analyzing the text, when we talk about this God, the God, it's, it's a singular tent. It's a singular form. There is no God like him. He is the one and only God. He's not a God, indicated by the, and he's not a part of these gods, meaning that he is the only living, true God himself. He is God. And he's God by himself. The next thing you must examine in this text, not only is he the only true and living God, he was not elected God. He was not selected as God. He just is God. The self-existing one. The one that was God before there was a win or a where. He's that God. So when you're calling on somebody, don't waste your time calling on other gods. <laughs> Call on this God, the God. He says, the God of Israel. Then he prayed. When he says, cry out, call on him. Call on him. When you call on him, you need to understand, it says, on that God. You need to call on that God. When you call on him, that means you're praying. And we talked about the fact that prayer is a dialogue, a communication between us and God and God and us. Prayer is a dialogue when we're talking to God and then we wait for God to talk to us. Prayer is not a monologue as some of us have made it. So when it becomes a monologue, then what are we doing? Are we praying? Or are we just calling words? Reading, reading teachers tell students all the time, stop just calling words, boy. What is he or she is saying when, they, when, they, when one of them say, stop calling words? The reader is not comprehending. He's just saying what's on the paper. He's not comprehending what's Okay, saying. one thing is the reader is not comprehending what he or she is saying. The other thing is it's not flowing properly. Because when you stop calling words, you will... Pause at a comma, 
you will stop at a period and then you will obey all the other punctuation. So, so he says, and Jabez called on the God of Israel. He's praying, and these are the words he said. This is New King James. He says, oh, that you would bless me indeed. When he says, oh, that, that, word, those, that phrase, oh, that means something. He says, oh, that. All that simply means that there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Jabez is saying, life for me has been ruined. Life for me has been bad. Life for me has not been good. But when he says all that, he realizes that there's a great possibility that God can do it. Not only does all that means that there's a possibility, all that means that you will or will you. All that, will you? He has the confidence in this God. When you pray and you pray to the right God, you ought to have confidence in that God. He says, I know it's a possibility. The next thing he says when he says, oh, that, He's also saying, in the midst of impossibilities, I know it is possible. In the midst of impossibilities, I know it's possible. Songwriter talks about the fact that he can do what no other power, Holy Ghost power, can do. And one of the authors in the book, Fix My Prayer Life, Pastor Smith says that God specializes in the impossible. The songwriter said God specializes and he can do with no other power. And then he stops and rejoices and say, Holy Ghost power. No other power can do. And then he says God specializes. In the impossible. So Jabez is saying, in the midst of the impossibilities, in the midst of impossible situations, in the midst of bad conditions, God, I'm asking you to make an exception. <laughs> what he's saying is, I'm praying to the God who I got confidence in. I'm praying to the God who can do the impossible. I'm praying to a God who can take the bad conditions who can take impossible situations, who can make an exception on my behalf. J-Bad says, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. The word bless means reward me. The word bless means congratulate me. It, it is... It is the same word we get the word to cause to kneel down. So Jabez is a picture of us in prayer kneeling down before the awesome God. He says, congratulate me. He says, cause me to kneel down before you. See, if you're going to be blessed by this awesome God we're talking about, if you're going to be blessed by this God, Guess what? You're going to have to be willing to humble yourself before him. The word blessed means to cause to kneel down. It's the same word we get the word adoration, mean to adore, to reverence God. He says, Lord, I reverence you. Now he's already knows, he's already identified that he's praying to the right God. He's already identified that he's praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's already identified that he's praying to the God who is a proven God, who is the proven God. He's already identified that, and now he's saying, bless me. And when he says, bless me, he's saying, Lord, I adore you. Lord, I magnify you. And we've heard that before. Jesus says, when you pray, you adore God first. When you pray before you ask for something, you need to give God glory. 
Pastor Smith says in this book, Fix My Prayer Life, he says that you need to engage God, realizing that you want the ultimate purpose of God to be fulfilled. Where there is no fulfillment, there is no blessing. So God's purpose needs to be fulfilled. That's why James says, when you pray, you pray a mist. Meaning that when you pray, you pray with the wrong motives. When we pray, we ought to pray to create a tighter bond, a tighter fellowship with God. So when we ask God to bless us, we are not asking God to pour his blessings down on us in the physical realm. We want him to bless us to be a part of him in the spiritual realm. Good God Almighty. Jabez, Jabez says, call out to God. He called out to God. He says, oh, that you would bless me indeed. I know it's possible. I know you're the God who, who make the impossible possible. And he says, bless me indeed. In other words, bless me sure enough. Mm -hmm. Bless me sure enough. Bless me. Bless me. Now, he does not say bless me anyhow. But he does say bless me for sure. And when God blesses us for sure, guess what God does? He sees himself and he moves himself in the presence of other people that normally would not be blessed by him. So that they will have an opportunity to bless God. So they would have an opportunity to praise him and to glorify him. One of the authors in the book, and I don't know which one it is, one of the authors in the book talks about prayer being not only prayer of asking, not only a prayer of glorifying, but it's also a prayer of praise. So prayer ought to be both a praise period and a prayer period. This word prayer also means to worship. So when we go before God in prayer, we ought to worship him. We ought to adore him. We ought to praise him. So he says, bless me indeed. Bless me for real, God. Bless me for real. Let me ask you a question. When you pray, do you want God to really bless you? Yes. Now, let me ask you this. When you pray, do you want God to bless you the way God needs to bless you, or you want what you want when you want it, the way you want it right now? <laughs> Be honest with me. Do you want God to bless you uh, for the long term or bless you for to get you out of trouble right now? Mm -hmm. Deacon Alpha prayed that prayer many times. God, if you get me out of this. God, if you get me out of this, God, if you get if you get me out of this, I, you know, some of us pray wino prayers. You ever pray the wino prayer? I'm not talking about you a wino. I'm just saying winos pray the same prayer every time they get drunk and can't get their way back, find their way back home. God, if you get me home this time, I ain't gonna ever take another drink. Thursday gets here, they prepare for Friday. Friday gets here, they all away sloppy drunk. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that Jabez is saying, God bless me for real because I want to bless you for real. He says, bless me indeed. And when God blesses you indeed, guess what happened? Other folks see the blessings and glorify him. King Nebuchadnezzar. And we butchered, we butchered that name so many times. Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Eric Belt suddenly called him Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> I call him Nebuchadnezzar. Somebody else called him Nebuchadnezzar. So we have to understand that when we look at King Nebuchadnezzar and he saw how the God of Daniel, the God of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego pulled them out of the fiery furnace pull them, and we'll talk about that later, how he pulled Daniel out the lion's den, he threw up both hands. King Nebuchadnezzar praised God, the true and the living God, when Daniel told him his dream, then interpreted his dream. When, when Shadrach, Meshach, was in the hot fire of furnace, and he saw a fourth man walking around in the fire, in the fourth one looked like the son of God. 
He said, you better not talk about that God that these boys serve. <laughs> when God blesses you indeed, other folks see God blessing you and they have no choice but to glorify your God. Mm -hmm. The problem is the saints of God want to get their secret blessings mm -hmm. and they don't want to be blessed in the presence of other people. Why y'all do that? Hmm. Or you want to be blessed in the presence of other people as long as as they can see what you're driving and how you live. Jabez said, bless me indeed so that you can, so I can be a witness for you, Lord. So other people, as Jesus would say, you don't light a candle and sit it on a bush. You light a candle and put it on top of the hill where everybody can see it. Remember now, you're lighting a candle. You're doing the lighting. You are the light of the world. You, you are the one that's the salt. You're the one that's the light. Jesus being the light of the world, you want people to see the light. You are the light of the world. But when they see the light, they don't glorify you, they glorify God. So, so J.B. says, bless me indeed. Bless me so others can see you. And glorify you. The next part of that prayer he says. And enlarge my territory. He says. Broaden my horizon. He says. Become great through me. He says. Enlarge. This word enlarge. This word enlarge in Hebrew means. Become great. It means to have much increase. It means to multiply, to be in authority. He says, God, I've been messed up all my life. But God, I need you to do me a favor. Enlarge my territory. Bless me to do things. Bless me to go places that people would never dream of. You all know, I don't supposed to be in Houston, Texas. I grew up, as many others, the Urbans, the Stuckies, the Clarks, the Wallaces, the Davises. We all grew up on Four Mile Plantation. You know what Four Mile is, though. Oh, I, I didn't think so. Four Mile Plantation. It was so dark, y'all had to be in before the street light came on. We didn't have a street light. I got, I rode through there when I went home, and man, it was black dark. Still today, it's still black dark. And here I am standing in a church in Houston, Texas. We don't know what the population of Houston is anymore. We used to say three million. Uh, we guessed four million. But here I am standing in the midst of three to four million people all the way from Four Mile, Mississippi. And we didn't say Four Mile. Four Mile, Mississippi. You know I don't supposed to be here, but God has enlarged my territory. In the year of 2000, I just had this vision. I, I was watching. It was before the year of 2000. I was watching Jimmy Swaggart preach. Yeah, Jimmy Swaggart. I was watching Jig Jimmy Swaggart preach. And I noticed as he preached, his interpreter mimicked, mimicked him. When Jimmy Swagger was excited, his interpreter was excited. When Jimmy Swagger ran across the room, his interpreter ran across the room. And I remember sitting in my little bachelor apartment, just been called to preach, and I said, Lord, bless me to preach like that. With the interpreter, bless me to preach like that. With, with the enthusiasm, bless me to preach like that. With the passion and the love, 
God bless me to preach like that. This is my private conversation to God. So in 2000, my wife and I went to a conference on Jabez's prayer. The whole conference was centered around Jabez's prayer. After I left the conference, I had this dream of God broadening our territory, God increasing our coast, God taking us to new regions. So what I said, you know, I'm always, I can always dream of some work for Carolyn to do, you know. <laughs> so I said, I said, honey, this is what we need to do. We're going to take every version of the Bible that we know. And we're going to do this uh, First Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. We're going to translate it in every pass this one passage in every particular version of the Bible we can find. New American Standard. Uh, at that time, it was New American Standard, King James, New King James. Uh, we dibbled and dabbled in NIV. So we took every version that we knew, Holman Christian Bible. We had um, a new revised version. And we, we took, we sit down and we, we printed out every version we knew and put him in a, a frame and put it in every room of the house, including the restroom, including the closet. We put this particular prayer, Jabez's prayer, in every room we could find with different versions. I mean, any version that we could find. And, and the key was, Lord, broaden our territory. Remember, in the 90s, I've already prayed, Lord, bless me to preach with, with the interpreter and, and bless me to preach with that, that zeal and that enthusiasm as Pastor Jimmy Swagger. Here it is, year 2000. We, we receive this vision to put all of these scripts, this same scripture in every room. That same year, I mean, I'm praying, Lord, Enlarge my territory. Give it authority. Make it big. I've totally forgotten about the prayer I prayed in the 90s. But when we put it in every single room, year 2000, we boarded a plane to Brasilia, Brazil, to be missionaries to Brazil. And they flew in my own personal interpreter. Mm. Mm. Everybody else got, got paired with an interpreter, just somebody that spoke English and, and Portuguese. Everybody else on the whole team, must have been 10 of us, everybody else on the team, they said, well, you go with him, you go with her, you go with him, you go with her. But they flew in Junior. Junior was like 20 years younger than I was. But we were the same size, the same stature. He was a little more light-skinned because he was a Brazilian, so he's a little more light-skinned than I was. But they paired him with me, and our hearts just melted together. And the only thing I had to do with Junior is go over my outline before I stood and preached. And one day, I took off running to the right, Junior took off running to the left, and when I got through with that statement, we were right standing back in front of the mic together. I had a little hair during that time, and Junior had a little hair during that time. And so we would dress casually to go out on the street and witness. Then we would dress up for the Sunday service. And, the, you know, they had service every day of the week from 6 a.m. to 1030 at night, every day of the week. And once, one particular day during the week, I showed up with a blue pair of slacks on, I showed up with a blue pair of slacks on in a blue vest, white shirt. Junior shows up with a blue pair of slacks on, a white shirt, and a blue vest. And I have that videotape now where, where I was preaching and he was interpreted. I was preaching, he was interpreted. 
and I saw the vision come true because I really believe that we seriously and honestly pray, Lord, enlarge my territory. God will take you places that you've never been, never thought of going to. God will enlarge your territory. He will enlarge your coast. This word territory means to enlarge your coast. This word territory means borders and boundaries and regions. So God enlarged, and guess what? When God started enlarging your coast, he won't stop with that one visit. So we took several trips to Brazil, several trips to Brazil, several trips to Brazil, year after year after year. And every year that I went, as we prepared to go, my spouse said to me, I'm not going back this time. But every plane flight I talked, I, I caught she was only two. <laughs> we had prayed that God will enlarge our territories. So God did some things that we didn't pray about, we didn't know about, things that we could not have assumed. He enlarged our territory. Not only were we able to go to Brazil, then we end up in Czech Republic. Well, we were known as the chocolate people. They would walk up to us and start rubbing our face to see what had come off. The chocolate people. And when we went to Brazil, I took my book, my, my workbook called Sharing the Gospel. And by the time we got there, it was already translated into Portuguese. We were able to teach the whole book before the people. Because God had enlarged our territory. It was the one time that I was able to preach to 8,000 people at one time. Because God had enlarged our territory. And many from the Houston area went, and they were able to teach from that book in, in the presence of 2,000, 3,000 people at one time. Because God had enlarged our territory. So we come back, we spent from 2000 to 2005 on short-term missions between Brazil and Czech Republic. We come back, then people want to know more about the book. So now as I stand today, the book has been translated, the book that God gave me vision to write has been translated into eight different languages because God enlarged my territory. I'm saying to you, if you got a vision, take it before the Lord. And ask him to bless you indeed. Bless me sure enough. Enlarge my territory. The next part of that prayer. In verse number 10. First Chronicles chapter 4. Verse 10. He says that your hand would be with me. You don't want to go anywhere. If God is not there. And you don't want to go anywhere. Without God's hand leading you. A lot of folk in some marriages these days and God's hand didn't lead them. A lot of people have made some investments and God's hand did not lead them. A lot of people have moved in the house and their, their neighbors are, whoo, but if God didn't lead them. So we have to understand we want God's hand to be with us. And when we get in fix, when we get in situations, we want God's hand to lead us to get us out of it. That's right. You don't want to just do things. You don't want to just do things out of anger. You don't want to do things because you can. You want God's hand upon you that God will lead you. That's right. He says that your hand will be with me and that you would keep me from evil. You see, when God's hand is with you, God can keep you from evil. See, I'm going to tell you something. I need God to rescue me from me. I don't have to go and look for evil. I need God to rescue me from me. Rescue me from my personality. Rescue me from my background. Rescue me from the things that have happened in my life that can shape my life. Lord, I want your hands to be with me and rescue me, keep me from evil keep me from the evil one in that you would keep me from evil 
that I may not cause pain. that I may not cause pain. If God's hand is upon you, if God keeps you from evil, then you won't cause pain to yourself and you won't cause pain to other people. And look at how he ends it. So God granted him what he requested. I think it's King James that said, and God granted his request. He had the right heart. He had the right mind. He, had, he didn't let his background, where he came from, how much money he didn't have. A lot of people need to be in school, but they won't go to school because they don't have the right amount of money. God gives you more once you get started than he, was before you, than he does before you get started. It's a faith walk. Everything we do is a faith walk. Walk in the door with the favor of God upon your life. Walk in the door and let God's hand be upon you that you will not cause pain and that you won't cause others pain and you won't be a victim of pain. The Bible says this old boy from the backwoods of Mississippi, mm. from Four Mile Plantation, God's hand has been upon him Amen. that he will not cause pain. Now, I didn't say that I haven't caused pain because sometimes I didn't let God's hand stay upon me and I caused pain. But when God's hand is upon you, he can grant you your request. Don't you want him to grant you your request? Don't you want him to say yes and amen? Yes, yes, yes. So look at this J-Bear's prayer. Ask God. First of all, to make you humble, to make you honorable. Then it says, even though you came up in some bad situations, call out to the real God, the God of Israel, that God will bless you indeed. That God will enlarge your territory, give you a different job, give you a different relaxation, give you retirement. That God will Enlarge your territory. Whenever there's new territory, it's not always going to a place. It could be going to a mindset. It's a state of mind. It's a condition. It's a lifestyle. It's new territory. He says that your hand would be upon me, that your hand would be with me, that your hand will guide me, that your hand will steer me in a direction where I will be without evil and that I may not cause pain. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the one that caused pain. The Bible says God granted him his request. Mm -hmm. And as we pray, we must remember Daniel prayed, David prayed, Jesus prayed. He prayed on his way to Calvary. He died on Calvary. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose from the dead. Amen. The door of the church is open. Amen. Jesus the Christ is the righteous lamb of God. And if you can believe this story, that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. You can be saved right here, right now. Trust Jesus. Because even in impossibilities, with this God, the God, all things are possible. Will you try him? If this is you, bow your head with me and invite him into your heart. That you can be born again, that you can be saved right here, right now. Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. 
and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you're now born again. We believe that when you die, you will go to heaven. We believe that you have a new commitment to Jesus Christ. We believe that God's hand is upon you. Also, if you are without a church home, or you're in between church homes, I recommend the New Beginning Church in Southeast Houston. Inbox us and let us know that you need a church home. We'd be glad to, to invite you to the New Beginning Church. We'll welcome you to this family of faith. As we close out tonight, I want to thank you for joining us and being a part of our service. And let you know that we're praying with you and praying for you as you walk through tough situations. We're going to ask God to bless you indeed. And it's now offering time. And it's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can do so by either mailing your offering in to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can zell it in. You can zell your offering, your tithes, your, your gifts in to the zell account, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com As we spend our time in prayer, we want to lift Sister Darrington, Vivian Darrington, in prayer. As we spend some time in prayer, we want to lift Sister Lydian Darrington. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for for being on site and online. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we glorify you. We magnify you. Thank you, Father God, for those who, are, who need your help, who are ailing. We ask you to comfort, heal, and bless as you, you can and you alone. We thank you that you are the God. You are the God who keeps us and blesses us. We thank you, Lord, for wrapping your arms around us tonight. We thank you for this, your word. We ask you as we go forth that you bless us indeed. Enlarge our territory. Put your hands upon us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. That we will not cause pain. Lord, we're asking you to grant us this request. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We are uniting the church, we're strengthening families, we're supporting schools, we're empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are lifting souls, reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.